Hello and welcome to another episode of Chasing Excellence. My name is Patrick Cummings and as always I am joined by Ben Bergeron. Every week here on the show we dedicate some time to exploring how we can live a life of better health and increased fulfillment. We answer your questions about the five factors of health, dive deep on living a life of excellence, and explore the strategies and frameworks to help us chase what truly matters. Thank you, as always, for joining us this week. How are you, Ben? I'm doing great. Thanks, Patrick. We are going to just jump right in. We're going to jump into our warm-up uh, where we answer uh, questions about the five factors of health, those few fundamental behaviors that most positively affect our performance, vitality, and longevity. Those five factors are how we eat, how we move, how we think, how we connect, and how we recover. So we've got listener questions for uh, one listener question for each one of those categories. Let's get right into it with the move category. This is from Sarah. I started CrossFit a couple months ago, and I'm on a weight loss journey to hopefully lose 150 pounds. I gained the weight when I, as a, a varsity high school athlete, tore up my knee and faced multi-year a multi-year long recovery. I've heard really bad things about CrossFit in that it injures athletes. My question is, is, is CrossFit the best platform for major weight loss, and how can I, how can I avoid injury? Well, first off, congrats, Sarah, on your journey. That's an that's a incredibly lofty aspiration. 150 pounds is no joke. So... Um, go get it, like go do that thing. And I'm glad that you're asking what you think is the most efficacious and safest program to help you out. I do think CrossFit, obviously it's what I'm, I'm, I'm I own a CrossFit <laughs> gym. I do think it is the platform to help people achieve um, weight loss at any level. Um, but then the question is, is it safe or am I going to get injured along the way? And here's my, my personal viewpoint on that. When we first opened up the gym, we were a really competitive gym. You know this, you were a part of this, the gym back then. And we had a lot of injuries. We did. We had um, shoulder injuries, knee injuries, and back injuries as the most common thing. Over the last at least five years, if not a little bit longer, we've really shifted gears away from the competitive aspect. And we are here to help people like Sarah and people with longevity goals, mostly because selfishly, my interests have shifted. I'm not gonna say we don't see injuries, because we do, but we don't see the injuries that caused the this under undercurrent in the, the CrossFit rumor mill about mm -hmm. CrossFit's gonna get you hurt. The injuries we see now are um, like any, they're like more like the slip and fall type injuries, right? Like somebody, um, bangs their shin doing a box jump, that type of thing. What we don't see is the slap tears, the labrum tears, the um, disc issues in backs. Like that stuff just, it kind of went away as we morphed away from the competitive aspect. Mm -hmm. So the short answer for Sarah is if you don't get wrapped up in either the sports or wrapped up from your ego in chasing something that's above your capacity, yeah, it's the safest thing you can do because the most unsafe thing you could do is not do functional movements at all. And that's the first underlying, that's the first principle of what we do. We do functional movements. Mm -hmm. That is the thing that we need to be doing as human beings. If you don't do them, you're going to get hurt in the real world. And that's one of the funny things that no one really talks about is, you know, my mom wasn't doing CrossFit and she got frozen shoulder, but no one talks about like, well, if you don't do this, you're going to get hurt. So um, it's not me being um, defensive of the of the subject because we did see a lot of injuries for the first six or seven years. But the back half of this journey, the last five or six, um, they're really, really few and far in between. So Sarah, I do think that you're on, the, on a great path. And I do think this could be an incredible vehicle for you in your weight loss journey. Okay. Our next question is in the think bucket. And this is from Carson. When you are approaching an event that you know is an opportunity to perform well for you, how do you keep from focusing on the quote unquote result you're expecting? How do you tune into the process and that day's task at hand? Ah, oh, such a great question. Okay, this is kind of the crux of what we're all trying to do, right? Which is this big buzz thing in our world over the last few years, which is like be present. And this whole mindfulness movement evolved out of this thing. And what that means is at a really high level, it's like be where your feet are. Don't be on your phones. Don't be distracted. 
But there's the next level to it, which is don't let your mind wander to the past or to the future, be where it is. Now, I know everyone on the show knows that, but let me just frame it a little bit. When your mind goes in the past, it's if it's um, thinking about something that's not optimal, it's going to have regrets or um, it's going to um, be a negative feeling, right? Mm -hmm. And if we're projecting out towards the future, we're going to have anxiety, stress, doubt, fear, whatever it might be. It's also going to be that. So here's herein lies the challenge. Can we, when we feel those things as Andrew? Carson. Carson. Andrew. Thank you, Carson. <laughs> um, as Carson's alluded to, which is he knows what to do, is to pull back into this moment. So as you start to think about the results, positive or negative, we're not here where we are right now. We can make the most changes. Now, when we talk about that, all we're doing is just pull back, Carson, pull back, pull back. This is the work. Now, the work, it's really hard to do this when you have something really meaningful in front of you, right? So we have your job interview, you have your performance, you have your championship game. Those are the big ones. It's really hard to pull back in the present. We're there. What we need to do is practice all the time with the small things because you can't. The answer is, Carson, you can't if you haven't practiced. But just like everything else, you need to practice this all the time. So what this means is becoming aware of these inner feelings and becoming aware when your stuff is getting hit. You have a inner sense of well-being. You're at homeostasis. You're at center. Something comes along that knocks you off center. Something that brings something up from the past. God, a lot of regret about that. I wish I had done that. Or fear, doubt about anxiety about the future. Like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? When you feel those things, pull back to center. You can't move forward as productively when you're not at center. Think about it. Point A to point B, the fast way together is a straight line. That's the center. When we're trying to move forward through our lives, what happens to most people is they're constantly getting bumped off side to side. Think about the past, think about the future, think about the past, think about the future. You're not going to get to where you want to go as quickly, as efficiently when you're bumping up against the walls of the hallway. It's a much easier, more enjoyable process and you get there faster when you walk down the middle of the hallway. What we want to do, and this is our challenge all the time, is simply be aware and recognize when we're getting bumped off of that center. And I imagine that's the case on big things and small things, right? Well, it's because the, the, yeah, so the to me, the, things, this is like the what happens in the big thing. So the big thing is, as Carson's alluding to, he recognized that, like, oh my gosh, I got this huge thing. What do I do? Well, the answer is, Carson, it's it's kind of too late. Yeah. Like, I hate to say it, but like, it's too big to deal with. You're past your threshold. Mm. It's going to overwhelm you. You got to work on all the small bite-sized things along the way. And all that will happen is, just like your fitness, your threshold will move up. And the things that you'll feel it. You All of a sudden, like, you, you, there'll be this day that, like, somebody said something that used to kind of, like, bump you off center. And you go, whoa, that is, like, I'm not getting emotional about that. Mm -hmm. I'm not overwhelmed by that. I, what you're saying is, I can handle it. And then all these little th things start to become, now you work on the medium things and you work on the bigger medium things. And then eventually we're able to handle the really big things. But for right now, like it's going to be, those are, those are hard. It's hard to not project forward when you have um, one of those big life moments. Mm -hmm. So just work on the small things. Love it. All right. Next one is in, in the eat factor. And this is from Mandy. How do you and Ben feed your kids, especially for school huh. lunches? Do they get teased or feel peer pressure to eat like other kids? Do you aim to get them a certain amount of protein? So, so I'll let, she, asked, she asked both of us, so I'll let you take the crack. At yeah, this I'm first. happy to. The, um, so just for context, I've, I've, I've my oldest is five and a half, so he's in kindergarten. So we're just starting the school lunch. Um, and I'll be honest, there are mo more days than not he comes home with, so he, he brings his lunch. Um, and he comes home with everything eaten except the protein. <laughs> huh. So we're yeah. working on that. So we've tried, we've tried different things. What chicken, do you do for, yeah, I was gonna... chicken, um, hard boiled eggs. Sometimes we've, tr we've tried salami and we have like periods where it's like, oh, great. He ate it. And then period, like a week or two, he's just like, yeah, he's not into that anymore. And so, um, 
So what I do is uh, I take care of breakfast and lunch in the house. And so I load them up with protein in the morning. Mm -hmm. I do sausages and a, some oh egg God. or some cheese or um, perfect bars. And so mostly for breakfast, he gets almost exclusively protein and maybe a little piece of fruit. But I, he'll eat the fruit if I give it to him. If I just give him the protein, he just yeah. eats the protein. Because I know at lunch, he tends to kind of be in a deficit at that point because he just doesn't eat it. Mm -hmm. um, and so in terms of like the kind of the sub questions like peer pressure, he does notice that a lot like some of his friends get uh, like they buy lunch yeah. and and some of his friends don't eat, you know, healthy foods. But he's not at the age where people are. The other kids are like, you know, why are you eating the vegetables and the fruit? So I, we haven't we haven't gotten that yet. We haven't we haven't dealt with that. But your your kids are a little bit older, so I'm curious. So my kids right now, my littles are eight and ten. So they're in uh, third and fourth grade. Um, and just for some examples of what we do, um, similar, our kids we try to we try to do the same thing, which is really cool. We try to give them the protein in the morning. Harley, my daughter, eight years old, phenomenal. She does the eggs and all of that. Um, but Bodie will do uh, bacon. So we actually go with we had really I've high seen quality sources. Pictures of him eating bacon. Yep. So we his uh, no thing is some fruit, either cut up apples or berries, um, and bacon. Harley will do that. I will also do um, gluten free bread. They are um, not celiac, but they're gluten sensitive. So we will do gluten free bread, and we do um, peanut butter on that. They're both small and lean. So we try, it's a kind of a calorie game as much as it is a health food yep. and a um, protein thing. Um, and then for lunches to try to get in the protein, we also do milk. We, they've, yes. they've recently gotten into whole milk, which is phenomenal. It's so like, it's kind of like, um, as long as they tolerate it, cause there is uh, dairy intolerances, but in terms of like the protein, carb, fat makeup of it, it's almost like a, uh, it's a terrific food. Um, so they'll do massive amounts of milk. And then for lunches to try to squeeze lunches, they'll do anything from like, again, a, uh, um, all fruit spread. So another code word for jelly, but like not with a crap in it, um, and peanut butter and jelly or on rice cakes. Um, they do, they like beef jerky. They do cheese sticks. Cheese sticks. Yeah. Um, and then they'll do, uh, hit or miss on other forms of like traditional protein, like certain things of like chicken and stuff like that. A lot of times they come home and it's not all the way eaten, stuff like that. Uh, we put, we'll heat it up and put it in a, a Yeti thermos. We've mm -hmm. tried it with um, so eggs. That it's warm it. Yeah, it's cool. so it's warm. Yeah. Tried it with eggs. We tried it with uh, cut up pieces of, of burger. Um, but other kind of staples are apples and other forms of fruit and um, rice cakes, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, rice cakes are big. Yep. Yeah. So um, I've asked my kids a number of times and kind of systematically, like every few, uh, maybe it's, I don't know, every few months or so, it's like, do other kids eat like this? Do they make fun of you? Because Harley used to bring in like shrimp mm. and she used to bring in. I think that's what she'll do is like cut up avocado yep. or, I mean, stuff that's not on the normal, yep. you know, lunch fair at an elementary school. And they're like, no, they don't, they don't, you know, I was like, do kids eat like this? They're like, no, they mostly eat sandwiches, but um, they, I, they actually don't, which I was surprised about. I think, mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit different than when we grew up. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking last night at um, one of my kids' soccer practices, how this younger generation, they're I think it's the transparency of like, no one has to be perfect anymore. This like level of like, when we were growing up, no one wanted to be like outside the norm circle at all. Like if you were an outcast and now with all this, I don't know if it's the, um, the Insta famous thing, but they realize like being different is kind of cool. Yeah. And if you were different when we were growing up, you were an outcast. Right. And now, like, if you're normal, you're, been, if you're we, normal and you're kind exposed, of boring it. But, yeah, and, we've been and, exposed to all the different kinds of yeah, different. So, yeah, so um, I don't think I don't think that people bringing in different types of uh, meals is is cause for bullying just yet. Um, last thing, because clearly we talked about this for a while. Last thing I'll add, because you, you mentioned chicken, and one of the things we do that uh, I'm blanking on the, the uh, Mark Sasson had like a sauce company. He sold, he, it's Primal Kitchen. Primal Kitchen. Yeah. And so we'll like at dinner, sometimes at lunch, we'll put some of like the ranch or the Caesar dressing and it's just like avocado based. Oh, yeah, yeah. And no, if they, That's and they dip it in dressing. and they'll, they'll eat the chicken from there. So sometimes just a little bit of. So at dinner, we, they do a good job with protein. So dinner, what we found is, yep, um, grilled chicken cut up as long as there's no, there's, I don't want any black spots on it. Like yep. they're so sensitive <laughs> yep. to that. Yep. Um, but they also do burgers. Um, and the, the, the big hit is taco Tuesdays at our night. 
So um, ground up meat. And again, Harley's really a lot more adventurous than Bodie is. But our staple is kind of like chicken, um, burgers, tacos. Harley will go salmon, but that's about as, as adventurous as similar to us. Okay, cool. Let's move on to the uh, re- recover bucket. And this question is from Kate. You mentioned in a previous episode how you get to sleep, and this is obviously to you, how you get to sleep around 8.30 or 9 these days. Can you point to anything specific that changed after you extended your sleep times? Um, yeah, Kate, I wish I could. But uh, I people, this is one of the challenges um, – that I certainly face, and I don't know if other people relate to this, but people are like, okay, so you change this thing. Yep. How do you, do you feel better? Yep. And I've never been able to give a good answer to that because- mm. Just to the sleep one or just like in general? <laughs> so you started doing these yeah. supplements. And the difference is you started working with wild health. Do you feel better? You started getting your blood work and making these interventions. Do you feel better? You started doing, um, um, uh, you know, but there are certain things like- so, well, even like you start doing a sauna practice, you feel different. And I think that there's, it's one of the things that we've talked about on this before. There's a lag effect to everything. And because of that, by the time these things might come to fruition, the health benefits, you've made other lifestyle adjustments as well. It's really difficult. And this is one of the challenges we have in the health space to go change A, caused result B Mm -hmm. because if you start eating um, wild caught salmon three times a week as opposed to Atlantic, right? Farm raised salmon. How are you going to feel after one month of doing that? No different. Probably no different. And even if you, it was benefiting your health. Well, what if you just like had a really bad conversation with somebody like the moment before somebody asked you that question. <laughs> right. And and Patrick, tell me how like you felt health-wise um four months ago. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, like, yeah. It's so it it's yeah. It's I, I want to just bring to light, like this is it's a challenge that we all face in terms of making the interventions. And what we need to do is not necessarily go like, okay, made this intervention and now I feel so much better. But you make the interventions just because you know that they are the healthier path. And one of my thought processes is one of my f- f- mental frameworks that I like to just kind of is these best practices that we're putting out might might take a decade for them to actually settle and change you. Mm-hmm. This kind of like aggregation of marginal gains type thing. What that means is, let's say. Um, you have a high school athlete, high school athlete, Jim goes to practice and works really hard at practice. High school athlete, Steve does the same thing, but after practice, say they're basketball players after practice stays and shoots for an extra 10 minutes Mm -hmm. after the next day, Steve's no better than Jim. But after two or three months, maybe his skills have, maybe his skills have improved a little bit. But after a year, there's a difference. After 10 years, they are light years different, right? That extra 10 minutes of work compounded over a 10-year period is a massive difference. It's the same thing of he invests $10 every day. Well, after a month, there's a li- I mean, maybe there's a noticeable difference. After a year, there'll be difference. But after 10 years, this is what makes the big differences. And it's the same thing that we have to do with our health is go, I'm going to put these practices into place knowing that tomorrow I might not feel any different. Now, the cool thing about what we do is a lot of times we do, like particularly like the runner's high and the endorphins and the dopamine and all that stuff of that. But we have to also combat that with the other things that we're up against that also give you like the more immediate thing. Mm-hmm. Like sitting on the couch, flipping through Netflix feels really good in the moment. We have to know it's on the other side sometimes and just put the faith in the process along the way, knowing that these efforts in the long run are going to pay off. Yeah. And I think there's also the case where if you're just, if you're starting from zero, zero to one, you're going to, you might feel those effects, right? I think about myself and others who like when they finally start paying attention to their diet, you can, like in a relatively short time, you can start to feel like 
oh, that's different. Like I can right. tell. It depends on how big the drastic the that's difference exactly. is. Exactly. Right? But once you get to a point, then it's yeah. then it's really just like it's kind of homeostasis, not in a bad way, but like this is just how I feel. If you ask me, like exactly to your point, someone that's sleeping four and a half hours a night, and now they start sleeping yeah. eight, yeah, you're gonna like the next day you're gonna be like cognitively, you're gonna be like, oh my god, you're gonna yeah. feel like you're on, you know, some sort of <clears throat> uh, ADHD medicine. It's gonna be amazing. Yep. But you moving from eight to eight and a half, yep. it's it's a subtler, longer term effect. Yeah, it's a recognition that the this behavior in combination with the other behaviors is actually what I'm after. Not this behavior leads to this particular result. Yeah. All right, last questions in our connect, uh, connect bucket. It's a bit of a long one, so I'll try to go quick. Mm. Uh, and it's from Joe. I'm a coach in the gym that I started uh, that I started in as a member, and I'm trying to encourage my friends and family to come along to our CrossFit box to try the sport I love. And the few of them that have attended have seemed to really enjoy what we do. The issue is when it comes to price. In the UK, the CrossFit membership is rough, roughly twice the price of other gyms and close to four to five times the budget of a 24-hour gym. My question to you both is how do I justify the price of membership that often seems to be the only sticking point. I explain how much support coaches give and, the, and explain people often pay much more than this for one-to-one support. I quote what is uh, I quote the What Is Fitness article to them to allow them to understand the CrossFit ethos, but yet money seems to be the only thing stopping them. Yeah, my answer to that would be um, you don't. You, you don't. You're never going to like win people over on the, the price thing. So if you're an affiliate owner and if, if Joe was an affiliate owner, yep. And you're, you're that sensitive to that type of a conversation. You feel like you're losing a lot of members because of price. I would say you're charging too much. Mm-hmm. And you know we've had this conversation before, but to me, the way you figure out your price is what's the most that you can charge without feeling one ounce of guilt or trepidation asking for it. If when you say it, somewhere in your head, you go, this is a lot. <laughs> Maybe I, I don't, yeah. this is a lot of money. Like Joe just did. It, he labeled it out. So Joe, if you're the affiliate owner, you're charging too much. You go, listen, it's it's twice what a normal gym membership is, and it's four or five times the 24-hour ones. That's a lot. Then yes, it's too much. But if you, if Joe, if you said it's ten dollars more than a normal gym membership, Joe would go and then think about what you get out of that that amount. It's so much more that, and you just feel so much better about that. You know you're charging the right amount when someone says, you know, so we charge at our gym, we charge $222 and we put out to the members and the next year it'll be $223 and in 2024 it'll be $2,024. I didn't realize you guys did that. That's what we do. Yeah, we raise, love that. It's yep. in line with the year. So super simple. I'm a big fan of simplicity. Um, and raising a dollar every month, no single member has ever gone like, what do you mean? I'm out. Like, because I don't, I, I don't want to have that conversation. And if I went and said, we're going to raise it $20 in my head, I would go, wow, that's a big thing. So I, you can't raise it. If you go, whoa, that's a lot. I shouldn't do that. So, you know, you're charging the right amount first when you feel like it's the right amount. And then when they push back, the answer is yes, you're right. It is a lot. So we charge 222. You walk in the door and um, you're like, hey, this place is pretty cool. Took the class. I'm interested in joining. How do I do that? I'm like, well, you sign up for a membership. Your question is, how much is that? I say it's $222 a month. You go, whoa, that is a lot. If I start to justify it with the product offerings, with the services, with the bells and the whistles, you know, we have coaches that are level two and three certified. We have this all this equipment and rogue supplied things. We have all these classes, 10 classes a day led by these coaches. And we have these showers and nope, that's crazy. That's the car salesman. Mm. You going, whoa, you're charging $50,000 for the car. And the guy goes, yeah, but we have alloy wheels and right. rusted <laughs> proof bottoms and four wheel drive. And all in your head is going like, dude, that doesn't matter. It's a lot of money. The answer, if you're doing this right, in my opinion, when someone says, whoa, that's a lot, your response should be, I understand that is a lot. For a lot of people, that is a lot. You know what? We actually post our workouts for free online every day. You can follow along from home. And they go, well, I, I know, but I, I don't know how to do this. I want, I want coaching. Well, mm-hmm. then you go, and right away, they're already kind of like figuring out themselves. You go, okay, like, 
Well, we offer that, but there are other gyms in the area that don't charge quite as much of us. Just down the road, there's a few that charge 150 bucks. And right then they're going, subconsciously, they're going, what does this guy know about those other gyms and his gym that he's so willing to send me away? Same thing as the car dealer. Mm -hmm. If the car dealer goes, no, 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 but we have this and we'll, we have more stuff than what they have down the street. If instead he goes, yeah, I understand that. There's similar cars, not this car and not our dealership. But there are places that sell this type of car down the road that are about you know, 10, grand, 10 grand cheaper. You should go down and check out those guys. In your head, either like, this guy's amazing. I'm going to go do that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. Putting out good vibes in the world. Or you go like, why is this guy sending me there? Yeah. Like, does he know I'm going to be back? <laughs> <laughs> yep. And that's the way I think about price. Yeah. The only thing I would add just back to... Um, to Joe's kind of question about like, how do I get my friends on board here? And I think it might've been James Clear. I don't remember exactly who it says, but people, but he said, whoever, whomever this is said like, you don't change people's mind. You, you're, you're not asking them to change their mind. You're asking them to change their tribe to a degree. Mm. So what this question really is, is my friends don't value health and fitness the way that I do. And I'm trying to drag them into my tribe, the tribe of people who believe a gym membership is okay at 222 a month, right? And so to me, the question is, the answer will never come by convincing them that it's worth the price right. because the answer will only come when you convince them, however you do that, and that's a whole other conversation, when you convince them that health is worth it. Mm -hmm. Only then does $222 a month make any sense. Before then, then it can seem absurd because it's about value it's about the ind individual's value statement of what they believe is worth something. Right. Right. And so we can't change that by, <laughs> I love this, by reading them the what is fitness uh, article. Like it's, you're 700 steps too far away from what their actual concern is or what their actual uh, barrier is. And it's, it's, about, it's about identity and self-identity. I'm not the kind of person who pays $200 for health. And that's fine. Totally. So, what, so the next question is like, how do we get them there? You, you, you give them... You give them the, the first little drug, yeah. right? You give them the first. So follow along from free from home. Like do these workouts. It, it's a ton of money. I totally get that. Instead, just buy a, a a barbell used on Craigslist for 70 bucks. And um, whenever it says a machine, just run instead. And just follow along in your garage with an empty barbell. And you'll get incredible results. And don't try to, And then in six months, you'll be here. Don't do, just like, nope. just get them in that, that's that's such a big step. That's such big step one. Yeah. Love that. Okay, cool. Let's jump into, speaking of, let's jump into our workout. Um, our workout is just when we uh, take a subject, dive on it, deep dive on it for about 15 or 20 minutes. And we are going to talk this time around about work. Uh, this is something I've been thinking a lot about myself. This is something we touched on a little bit in uh, an episode two or three or four or five weeks ago. And the question really to me comes down to like very simply – is what do you feel the purpose of work is? Where does it where does it live in your perception of yourself, right? Because I think you and I probably have had a bit of a trajectory over the last 10 years where 10 years ago, our identity was pretty wrapped up with work. You know, like when you think about, my, you know, when, when I thought about myself, maybe when you thought about yourself, yeah, it was like, it was the relationships, but it was also like, I'm a person who works at this thing, or I'm a person who does this kind of thing. And I find myself over the last few years questioning whether that's the right way to think about it. Maybe it's just because my life is significantly different than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, and so I'm super curious about like w how you think about work in, again, in the kind of the palette of your life and, and, and in the kind of the palette of who Ben Bergeron is. Okay. So We've said it a lot here. I think that you doing what sets your heart on fire, you doing what you're passionate about is incredibly important. I really, really do. And I know that there's different schools of thought to this, right? Like there's um, work um, as a means to an end. Like let's do the do your job so that you can create the freedom in your life to do other things. So you can retire early or follow your true passions or... Um, um, give back to other communities and other things. 
here's my my take on this and here's the reason why I believe it's so important that we align it with our own values, passions, and purpose is that it makes up half of our awake time. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah. we've talked about this before, but like the three eight-hour pieces, right? So you, if you 24 hours divided by three is eight-hour chunks. One of those eight-hour chunks is taken up by your sleep. The other... Eight out eight of those hours is your work. So then the other eight is your free time. Four hours before work, four hours after work, or you kind of like play with the fractions however you want to. Maybe you get up late and it's one hour before work and mm-hmm. um, you know seven hours after work, whatever it might be, because you're a night owl. So that's a huge, huge part of what makes up Patrick. And I've been through this journey where I'm not passionate about what I'm doing. And I was playing the the work as a means to another end where I would go and sit in a cubicle waiting for the weekend, mm-hmm. waiting for five o'clock, waiting for the two weeks I got to go do my thing. To me, that's like a boxer walking into the ring. Kind of like, eh, we'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, you're going to get your freaking head ripped off. You're going to, you might die. Mm-hmm. And I, that's the way I think about not being passionate about work. You might die. Not literally, but metaphorically. Your life isn't full. Now, I realize that this is a big ask for a whole lot of people because most people are either doing the work as a means to an end. I'm going to save up a ton. I'm going to bust my ass so that when I am, Um, I'm going to do early retirement at age 50. I'll be able to go and kick it. There's a lot. So what that ends up doing is creating a lot of imbalance because you have to really go now and really save a lot, essentially live below your means and, or create incredible earning potential to be able to do that. Well, now we're out of balance. Like my whole thing is, can we be doing it now? Like work as a means to an end. You might not be here in 10 years. So what you've done is you've forfeited these prime years right now for something later. The second part of that challenge is it's a lot easier to just go get a job. It's a lot easier to go get a job as like you are a creative. You like to create things. You like to use your mind. You like to build things. You like to... Um, um, play with art in its many forms, but it's a whole lot easier for you to go out and um, mow some lawns. It's a whole lot easier for you to go out and be a uh, a trash removal guy. It's a whole lot easier for you to go get a job as an accountant or a lawyer or even a doctor, Like because there's a set path on how to do that. What you're doing, freelance, entrepreneur, create your own work all the time, use my mind. There's no set path for that. You have to go and do it all on your own. And the ambiguity and the the um, the the yes, freedom, but lack of a concrete path makes that a lot more challenging. It's so much easier just to follow a set path. And what happens is that's where a lot of us get caught up in. Now we're in this quote unquote rat race where we're not doing what we love and moving away from that sec- financial security to where what, what you're doing mm-hmm. is scary. It's hard. It's unknown, but it's exciting and there's passion and you're now the boxer walking in the ring like, I just love this. I love this. And that guy on the other side, I'm going to rip his head off because you're going in there with all of your fervor and all of your might and all of your energy and as a whole being coming and bringing your best to that moment, the work. He's the fight. The boxer's work is the fight. He's bringing everything to the fight. And if you don't do that, that to me is the opposite of chasing excellence. It's deferring what makes you alive. It's deferring your best to a later unknown date. And that's just, 
that's just something that doesn't um I can't relate with mm -hmm. because um it's out of center and it's out of um what we talk about all the time on the show living life for the purpose of fulfillment not for achievement yeah yeah it strikes me that there are some people who who I I kind of I follow, I pay attention to, I, I, I admire, who say, who say like, follow your passion is bad advice. And I think I understand where they're coming from, but I tend to, I tend to think about it as, one, these are people who have uh, long since um, forgotten that they were probably chasing their own passion when they started, because <laughs> they tend to be older and more successful. But, but more than that, what I tend to think about is, I've never gotten good at something that I didn't have passion for before I was good at it. And I think that there's some confusion that like follow your passion. It's you, you figure out what you're passionate about, which is a whole other conversation, but then that's where you stop. It's like, I found it and now I get to go do it forever. But to me, the, the figuring out of the passion, and again, you can put in whatever word that you want in there. I love your heart on fire. Um, that's just the beginning. That's just like walking in the door. And then it's about all the skills and the work and the effort and the iteration and the failure that, but without the passion, at least, and this, just speaking completely um, for myself, I can't get through the failures and the, and the, not that I can't get through struggle or failure, but absent something that I'm, something that's setting my heart on fire inside of it. I can't get the, I can't muster the energy to, to go through six or seven iterations. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be the thing like, it's my one singular thing. It's my reason for being. It's the reason I was born was to serve coffee to people, right? Like, right. but if serving coffee to people is something that you enjoy, that's what it is. It's like, do you enjoy this? That's like, that's your heart on fire. It doesn't need to be, because I think when people hear this, they misconstrue it as, well, this isn't it. So I'm going to try this thing. And right. this isn't it. So I'm going to try this thing. You don't need to, your, as to, and this is what spurred this for me. It doesn't need to be, you don't need to go and find your passion. You go and find something that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. And then through the development, because you'll enjoy the process, yeah. you have to enjoy the process, not the result. So I'm not going to go and um, become a high powered lawyer because I want the mahogany desk in the corner office and to be making $6 million you know, um, a year when I'm 55. I want to to enjoy the process now. And if you find something that you enjoy the process, well then, as you said, then you can enjoy the learning and the growth and the development and invest beyond just the requirements of the job and become pretty darn good at that. And then you have an impact on your community. Mm -hmm. The second part that's really important. So first one is, it's not like this, don't just bounce around like, Ben said, I got to find the right ladder to climb. This isn't it because you got one rung up and now you're going to do the next one and one rung up and you don't get anywhere. But the next one is, it's not just um, passion. It's, we want an overlap of three different categories. And when these things overlap, that's a potential opportunity to pursue. And that is, yes, one is your passion, the thing that you enjoy doing. But the next is, do you have some level of talent in there? Mm -hmm. Like you got to be, good at what you do. Otherwise you're, you're unhirable. Mm -hmm. And third is, is there economic opportunity there? So an extreme example of this would be, well, I really love baseball. Like I love baseball and yeah, there's huge earning potential in baseball, but I can't hit a baseball. Right. Like I'm terrible at baseball. So that w shouldn't be the thing I pursue. So that's because you don't have the talent one. We've already talked about the passion one. If you don't have passion, you're a boxer walking the ring that doesn't care about this thing. Like that's a dangerous place to be. You have to be passionate about it. But then the third one is the economic opportunity. And that is someone that, uh, um, somebody that is so passionate about ant farming. Mm -hmm. They just like, they love ant farming and they're the best single best ant farmer in the world. Well, what, Where's the economic potential in ant farming? Mm -hmm. Like that might not be the place. That might be where you want to do the work to, to, to towards another uh, as a means to another end, because there's no earning potential there. So maybe you get a job in another type of thing, another type of farming, or another type of um, 
animal or agriculture or biology or something else. So when your passion overlaps with economic opportunity, which overlaps with talent, that's a worthwhile pursuit in terms of career or work. Mm -hmm. um, has your, to one of the first questions I asked, have you, has your perception of work and its importance of work changed Let's just call it since you started the gym when, you know, 15 years ago, almost 15 years ago. Like, how is that? Again, because like I knew you enough back then. You worked a lot, right? Mm -hmm. It was part of who you are. It's what you wanted to do. Like you wanted to be in the in the gym all day long. Like, right, like that was. And then, of course, like life happens and you get married and you have the kids and et cetera. And I know your life now is um, is the, this striving for balance across these different kind of uh, elements of your life. How is that? How is your just your kind of. I don't know what to like. How important is work or yourself in work, as it relates to what you know what it was when you started? So when I started, I I think that my my understanding of excellence, chasing excellence, um, was a little bit more leaned towards mm. the excelling at what you do, yep. and it's evolved since then to be more holistic, more balanced across all of what you do, not just what you do for work. And I think that's what most people, when they hear chasing excellence, that's what they assign it to. Mm -hmm. It's either high achievement in the boardroom or the whatever the career of choice is, or athletics, but it's really kind of like that. Yep. And it certainly evolved to a more balanced thing and kids and family have a massive effect on that. But I also believe it's, um, you know, I've created some f more financial stability because I did work hard. Yeah. Now, when I was doing that, I wasn't working as a means to an end though. I was, I, I love, you know, I, you were here. I loved the hard work. So to me, that was, I was just investing into my passion into the thing that I really, really enjoyed. But when there's only three legs to the stool, there's less to balance. So you pour more into those things. Right. I only had, I didn't have a wife or a kid. So those fourth and fifth legs of that stool didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So more can go into that work one. I had my own health and performance and I had my own hobbies and friends. And I had my career that I was trying to build as an entrepreneur. Those were my three legs. Yep. Well, now I also have wife and kids. So there's, it's just taking, something has to come out of one of those legs to, to allow the other ones to stand up. Mm -hmm. what, what is your advice for young folks who hear this, this sometimes uh, countering advice of follow your passion and just as many people saying that's terrible advice. How do you suggest you know, I'm just thinking about, you know, Maya or Jonah, like how do you suggest that they start to navigate as they're just kind of entering into a life where work becomes, or yeah. certainly can become one of those legs of the stool? Um, where, how do you have them, is it not a balance? Like, you know, like don't worry about balance, work your butt off for some number of years. Like what is the advice you're starting to give um, give the, the older kids? No, it's the same, it's the same thing, like, you don't have to find the thing, right? But do something that you think you're going to enjoy. You have to enjoy it. So for really um, concrete examples, uh, Maya um, graduated college last year. She's now getting her MBA um, and she's looking to go into um, venture capital. Mm. And she's so excited about that. She's seen a little bit of that, you know, just through like uh, our friends. Um, and she got really excited about you know, some of my friends that do that and talking to them and it sounds so cool um, when she's done some of the um, work in terms of business development stuff in other areas. And um, she's obviously worked here as a startup. So she's very in, in, interested in the entrepreneurial side of things, but not as being an entrepreneur herself, but investing in them. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal. Like go and do that because you're interested and excited about it. And above that, Go have experiences. Life, life is about having experiences so you can grow and evolve. That's, to me, there's no other getting esoteric and really high level and maybe expanding this conversation a little bit, but 
as good a definition of the meaning of life is to grow and evolve, which means to have experiences, live your life and grow through those. You can't grow and evolve unless you do things. Now, you could even just like doing things could be like sitting, meditating, doing nothing, but you're doing something. As a young person, my advice is go and do it. Like just go and yes, go and try the VC thing. And then yes, if you after, and don't stop after six months, go and do it. Do it for a year and a half, two years. And after that, if you don't like it, like go and do something else. But um, if it's, if somebody, if she came to me and was like, hey, instead I'm really thinking about taking a year to go and travel around Europe with a friend, like phenomenal, like what an amazing experience. Like yeah. it's about the experiences. So um, the thing I wouldn't want her to do is just take the easy road of whatever that might look like, something that she's not passionate about. I'm just going to go and do this because I don't know, it seems like the thing to do that I could, you know, really set myself up for a good career. Mm-hmm. There's no passion. There's no, there's no, there's no life inside of that. It strikes me that it kind of embedded in that, and in some of the the stuff we we've been talking about, there's this kind of tuggle or, or this struggle again w- between um, safety and risk, mm. or at least perceived safety and perceived risk. Yeah. Right? When you set yourself up, say, "I'm going to go that, that thing that I love." Like maybe I don't know the skills for it yet, which means that there's probably a longer road between my today and when I get to do it, like quote unquote for real, or I get to, and man, it'd be a lot easier, or at least uh, to your point before, like, I'll just go be a doctor. Cause at least that, tr- that path is well. Is it funny that we're not going to be a doctor? It's yeah. like one of the most like <laughs> yeah. respectable professions in the world. Yeah. Um, and we love doctors. We do, we're absolutely. Yeah. It's just, it, the point is, the point is right there. Like you, you can, you can chart what that looks like. Okay. I start here. I go here and it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's it's not going to have lots of challenges, but um, but enough people have done it that you can say, okay, like that's what it looks like. Path is known. Yeah, yep. but when you go open a gym, cer- certainly 15 years ago, doing this thing called CrossFit, like there was no, mm-hmm. absolutely no guarantee that you weren't going <laughs> to yeah. absolutely eat it, right? And so it was risky, and, it per- and, and at least there was a perception of risk. And I always think about I always think about that word perception. It, to the the perception of safety versus the perception of risk. When you really unpack that, is is doing something that you care about risky, or is doing something you don't care about because it's e- because it's safer, yeah. actually more risky. So this is like a it's an exercise in semantics. So what is risk? What is safety? Um, and then it's also um, stepping back is which is riskier? Which is because um, I'm going to go work for. Um, Amazon, yep. right? I'm going to work for Amazon in the marketing department. Yep. Well, that seems like it could be safe. Say Amazon's a company that's not going to go away and all that stuff. So it seems really safe. But what is the thing that we are actually going for? And at its root, I think one of the greatest human values, things that we find important is freedom. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason I became an entrepreneur. It was because I wanted that freedom, the freedom to do things, to follow my heart, follow my passion, do things the way I wanted to own my schedule. If I had an idea, I wanted to um, push on it. And as you, as you um, lean more into the freedom bucket that I, I, the risk, yes, the, I believe that the risk goes up, but the risk is just different. Mm-hmm. It's a different type of risk. Um, it's certainly a bigger risk of complete failure, right? Because you get the years of experience with Amazon. You know, I've been, I've been uh, a mid-level manager in a marketing department at Amazon for the last five years. Like, okay, that's like, you can go probably pick it up and go and do it somewhere else. But what's the the risk is, are you going to really get to where you want to be? And I don't mean, again, work to a means to an end. I mean, where you want to be completely fulfilled every single day with a passion of your career. And 
the people that go the the safe route are risking that. Mm -hmm. It's harder to find that. So which risks do you want to go for? Do you want to go for like, you could fall on your face and end up nowhere, but at least you went for something that you love and are so passionate about. It's kind of like the guys that, you know, drive around in uh, buses for a decade in the minor leagues of their of baseball. Yep. You know, they make, you know, 60 grand a year traveling and sleeping in hotels or 45 grand a year. And they're, you know, there's career minor leaguers. Well, they're, they're doing what they love. Like they're doing what they love. But the risk is you don't crack into the bigs and you become this 36 year old with no work experience. And that's a risk. Mm -hmm. Well, the flip side of that is, nope, I'm going to go and, you know, we'll take that Amazon, th that mid market manager type thing. And I'm, yep, I'm, I'm earning 85 grand a year, but you know, I, I dread Monday mornings. I don't like my coworkers. I have no fulfillment in my job. Mm -hmm. Like it's from there, it becomes a individualized thing. What is right for you? Where do you see the risk? And um, I always, the way that me personally is if you're, um, if you're doing what, I'm not gonna say what you love, but what fulfills you because it's hard. Like, like anything's hard and you don't have to love every aspect of it. But if it truly fulfills you, if you're finding meaning in it, um, I know those are big buzz words right now. Like I want to have meaning. I want to have impact in my job. Yeah, it's, uh, you might not get that in year one, two, three, four, or five. Mm -hmm. But if you feel like you're on that path, I think it's hard to second guess where you're going because of what we start off this conversation with. It's half of your waking time. Like, don't you want to, go into the ring every day, like excited to th throw punches back and forth with that person on the other side. I certainly don't want to walk into that ring and go like, eh, we'll see what happens, but I don't really care. That's a, that's a really scary place that I, and I've been there. There's been certain things I've done where, and you know me, I, I, I pulled a cord on them, you know, um, when I find that's my litmus test, if I'm coming in and I'm like, I'm really not that excited about this thing anymore, you know, running events like the ECC, huge, massive events, you know, um, Boston's world trade center with, you know, all the who's who of our sport coming in is one of the three biggest events of the year. And, uh, I wasn't passionate about it. So it was like, let's just stop this thing. <laughs> Cause that's what I want to be able to do is get excited about every single thing that's a part of my life. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay. Let's wrap it up there and jump into our shout out. Our shout out is just when we uh, take 30 seconds and read a listener comment, review a note somebody sent us. And this one's from Caitlin. Just wanted to say a massive thank you to, your, to you and Ben for the work you do, you both do with sharing your knowledge and lessons on the podcast. I've been listening to you both since October of 2019 and all the knowledge I unknowingly obtained, <laughs> unknowingly obtained, we snuck it in. Uh, while listening, while, uh, listening while walking, running, stretching, working out has helped me get through one of the toughest times I've had to face in my life so far. Just wanted to share mm, my awesome. appreciation for the work you do. So thank you, Caitlin. Uh, we have a lot of Caitlin's that listen to the show, do, by the way. Do you way. feel like that's multiple, multiple that was Caitlin's? Ka the last shout out was from a Caitlin. Was it really? Yep. I think it was spelled differently, so I don't think okay, it was the same go. one. I don't uh, see the spelling. <laughs> so uh, if you haven't yet, uh, leave us a review, send us a note, um, find us in some way, shape, or form. Uh, let us know what you think of the show. It does help us uh, keep on going. So thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, everybody else out there. All right. Cool down. We have in the past... Uh, done episodes where we'll talk about the books we've been reading or the the movies we've been watching, various things. So I thought we'd just kind of jam it all together and do kind of like a recommendation roundup. Mm. So maybe three or four things from each of us, something we've been enjoying uh, and want to share um, across whatever it is, books, documentaries, cool. products, places, whatever. So I'll let you go first. Maybe do back and forth if you want. Okay. Um, so Heather and I have recently gotten into, not recently, but the last two years or so gotten into yoga. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of our morning practice. Don't do it every day, but the majority of the days we do it, uh, it's usually about a 20 minute thing and um, found one that just works so well with uh, the yin and the yang of what we do in terms of this high intensity training. What what I don't love is when you go and you know, you 
we work out really hard muscularly and high intensity is when you go into a, a, a yoga class and they try to make it similar. Mm. I want the exact opposite. Right. So let's like, for example, let's hold warrior two pose for like <laughs> six minutes. And you're like, I can't even keep my arms up because it's not yeah. because we're weak. It's because yeah. our, our shoulders, we need to recover. Yeah. So holding our arms up for three minutes is not what we need to be doing. So anyway, stumbled upon, um, and we've been following, um, this girl for um, uh, at least over a year now, and it's called Boho Beautiful, and it's Ying. So we are Ying and the Yang, right? So we are the Yang with CrossFit and high intensity, and ah, oh, let's go high intensity and the heavy metal music. The the Yin part of this is stretching. You you like most you're just holding stretching poses, not the strengthening aspect to it because we get plenty of that, but you're holding stretching poses for, usually it's for two or three minutes per and it's awesome. It's um, really well high, highly produced um, and we're we're big, big fans. Okay, so Boho Beauty is that Boho what you're Beautiful. Oh, beautiful. So I go in, when B-O- I do it. B O H O. And B O H O. YouTube is. Go on a, YouTube. Okay. Yeah, so I do is YouTube. And what I normally do is Boho Beautiful Yin, Y I N Yoga. So there's lots of things. They do meditation and Pilates and ab strengthening stuff. But um, B O H O, Beautiful Yin Yoga, and um, been phenomenal. Awesome. Cool. Uh, my first thing is a documentary on Netflix called Stutz. S-T-U-T-Z. I, Did I, you watch it? I So I watched the first uh, half of it yep. and I, turned off, I I couldn't find it again. I couldn't remember the name of it. Stutz. I knew it started with an S. Yeah. You're talking about- um, um, Jonah Hill. Yes, Jonah Hill's yeah. psychiatrist. So, exactly. Yeah. Oh so Jonah God. Hill's a, yes. an actor. It's really good. Yeah. And it's the, the film is- uh, a documentary, a conversation with his um, psychiatrist, whose name is Phil Stutz, who's this kind of like Brooklyn accent, yeah. uh, kind of hard edge psychiatrist. And uh, really, really interesting. And and uh, it made me want to pick up uh, Stutz's books. I think he's got two books that he co-wrote. Whoa. I haven't picked them up yet. But um, but really, were, I thought it was really good. Spell it. S-T-U-T-Z. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to finish that out. All right, awesome. Uh, Love it. Go. Okay. Um, I'll follow up with uh, something I've also found on uh, not next week, but on Disney Plus. Yep. We talked about this a little bit, I think, in a previous podcast. But it's Chris Helmsworth's yeah. Limitless. Limitless. Yep, I've got. And it's basically it. it's yep. basically kicking ass into your nineties. So it's about fasting. It's about breath work. It's about cold immersions, um, managing stress, um, acceptance, and people that listen to this podcast. Uh, it's really it's kind of like the the much better looking version, the Hollywood version, the Hollywood version of this, uh, in a sense. And it's really, it's six episodes. Um, I think it's incredibly engaging and a worthwhile watch. Cool. Uh, and you said Disney plus. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, my next one is, it's a completely random one, but I was thinking about it yesterday. Um, my next recommendation is libraries. Ha. Huh. I, cool. growing up, I, my, my mom would bring us to the library and we just spend hours there reading whatever. And then, High school, I remember for some reason they just gave me like a study period and I would just go to the library and I would just read and do whatever I was going to do there. And then in college, I did almost all my, you, you know, UMass, I, I did all my homework, all my work in the giant library there. And then, uh, and in Boston, when we lived in Boston, I spent a lot of time in the library there. And then we moved up to Maine and had kids and I didn't go to a library for five years. And now that the boys are a little bit older, we started to go back to the, it's like, it's not very, it's like, it's pl- it's nice, but it's not like, it's not big. It's not fancy in any way, but it's just so cool to be able to just go and wander down the stacks and bring the boys over and like, let them pick a book and, um, I, don't, it's, I know it sounds absurd, but like you just can go and you can wander around and you can. And the reason I really like it and the reason I think that I've started to think about it is with a library, like you go to a bookstore, like, am I going to buy this book? Do I want this book? Is this the exact book that I should buy? What if I don't like this book? What if I don't finish it? In a library, just get four books and just like pick one and bring them back in a month. And and even if you've only read one of them or half of one, there's no stress. So you can wander around and be like, that seems mildly interesting. I'm going to pick that up. Um, and so there's a discovery that we've kind of lost with Amazon because you go to Amazon, you know, like you literally type in the book you want and then they'll try to sell you other books, but like you're there for the one book and you go to a bookstore. It's like, I'm just there for this book and I hope they have it. And in libraries, just like, just wander and just Love grab it. some stuff and, and see what comes out. So anyways, that's my next recommendation is just remember that libraries are awesome and we should all go there more often. Our library has um, stopped like the, you have to return it by this date type thing. Mm-hmm. Heather and the the Littles went there last week, and I am not exaggerating one bit. They got 60 
books. <laughs> six zero books. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I was like, what? Like, especially so anyway. with kids, because the the, the they, so that's what they did. They each yeah. got like they each got twenty five books, and Heather got whatever. Like, she got herself ten. Good for Heather for being brave enough to sh- walk up to that desk with 60 <laughs> books and be like, put this it on is, my tab. Right. <laughs> Unbelievable. Mm. But I've also, I also I agree with that. Um, I used to go and do a lot of my work at, at libraries. And you go and you get one of those little study cubicles or rooms. It's phenomenal. Yep. All right. You go. All right. I'll go on offbeat one and two as well. And this is uh, maybe for any parents that have kids that are playing soccer. Um, in the off season, Bodie is now, Bodie is my 10-year-old, is playing futsal. Right. Yeah. I didn't know what it was either. Yeah. It's the it's the reason it's one of the reasons that Brazil is as good as they are at soccer. Yeah. It's a smaller, heavier ball played inside, but it's not indoor soccer. There's actually out of bounds. Okay. And it's only essentially it's like a four on four or five on five. So you get so many more touches than you would in a game. So in a normal game, Bodie might touch the ball yeah. a half dozen times. This he's touching it you know, a hundred times and it's all about foot control. And, um, I think it's a really cool way for kids. Anybody that has a kid that's interested in getting them to be better soccer players. Um, futsal, I think it's F U T S O L. And, cool. and is it like an organized sport? Like yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. He plays in a league. Got it. Cool. Yep. Actually it's a, it's a winter, it's a winter league. Yep. Cool. Yeah. I'd never heard of that. Um, all right. Next one's gonna be a podcast, uh, that I just started kind of dipping into, uh, called I will teach you to be rich. By Ramit Sethi. Cool. Sethi. I don't know if yeah. you've ever read his book. He's got I a haven't. book by the same name. It probably came out. I think he re-released or he updated it within the last three or four years, but it came out probably I don't know nine or ten years ago. Um, but the show is it's kind of it's 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 a really interesting show in in that. So what he does is he he has a couple on. So he's a he's kind of a financial guru as the name, um, and so he has a couple on whether married or just dating, and they sort of over the course of an hour or sometimes even longer, they'll kind of like pick apart at whatever the financial challenges are inside of that relationship. So sometimes they'll be, mar- you know, couples who've been married for 15 years. Sometimes they'll just be like uh, mid twenties, just starting to date, thinking about marriage and not sure how to do it. And it's just, it's fascinating and awkward and uncomfortable <laughs> to, to, to listen to, to people talk about money. Yeah. And to have to answer for some of their uh, assumptions or some of their, uh, Rami calls them invisible scripts. And he's really good at, at being. Um, I like the invisible not scripts being, a lot. Yeah, I do too. That's really not good. Not being too, like not handling anybody with kid gloves. I, I So the fun thing to do is listen to it with your significant other or like both mm-hmm. of you listen to it and talk to it. So Michelle and I started to do that. And she it was funny. She was like, when I first started to listen to it, I really didn't like him at all because he's kind of like, he's no BS. Yeah. He's like, Agitator. He, yeah, a little bit. But as you go, you can tell he's doing it from a good place. And he's actually just, he's really there to, to ask the questions that we often don't ask ourselves or ask uh, our significant others. And so, it, so he's got a little bit of an edge to him, but not so much that it's kind of too, too off-putting. Um, but really, really interesting to kind of listen to other people, kind of get to be a fly on the, on the wall a little bit. Take like, oh, that kind of sounds like me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or I'm uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable with that because that sounds like something that I've said before or I've felt before. And really, kind of starting to face your own stuff by first fa- let it, or by first kind of listening to other people stumble their way to facing their own stuff is a really interesting and effective way to like get yourself closer to where you need to be. Mm. Is okay. Like again, it's like I'm not that person, but I'm like close enough to that right. that like I now have to ask myself these questions. And uh, what would be an example? What be an example of like a question or a thing that he would kind of poke at that would? Um, so one of the so one of the one I think the most recent episode I listened to, which probably a few episodes back, he was talking to a um, a relatively younger couple. They had just gotten married and had a kid, and he was ma- she was a nurse, so she was making like a hundred grand, and he was doing something in sport management. He was making like fifty grand, and through the course of this conversation, Ramit kept kind of getting back at the fact that. Um, that the the young man was very he had some invisible scripts going as it relates to uh, um, the value of a person who wants to make more money, right? So when, when he unpacked it, he started to realize like, oh, when I moved to California, I surrounded myself with kids and families who like that was their status, and they and they 
use that status to kind of beat up on the kids who weren't like that. Mm. And so he had started to associate, if I'm the kind of person who wants to go make a lot of money, I'm the kind of person who treated me badly when I was mm. 14. Money is evil. Yeah. So just starting to kind of like yep. answer those questions and say like, yeah, but what do you mean by that? Like, why that? Um, just, again, was really interesting. Cool. So again, it's called I Will Teach You To Be Rich. Um, and the book is good, but the podcast is is a different kind of good. All right, I'll give you one more if you've got one more. Uh, I'll, I'll go with uh, well, I'll do qu- two quick ones. Um, on Netflix, there's the Redeem Team. Mm, don't know that. So it's about the U.S. Uh, basketball team going back to win gold after they kind of had this debacle um, for maybe even two Olympics, and it's really cool. Um, it's basically there's a lot about it. It's Coach K from um, yep. Duke, but it's really Kobe. Mm-hmm. Kobe's, you realize like how badass that dude was. Holy smokes. Any, anybody that has any sort of like uh, basketball interest or team and leadership um, or a Kobe fan has to watch that. It's really cool. And then another one is um, kind of similar, is Onward, which is a book by Howard Schultz, who's the CEO of Starbucks. And it's, I didn't even really know about this, but it's how Starbucks um, kind of fell on their face in the um, 2007, 8, 9. Mm, right um, the lo- yeah, lost um, right before and then going into the recession. Uh, basically lost, uh, I would say that they were on the verge of bankruptcy, but they uh, ended up closing down, you know, 400 stores. They lost 60% of their shareholder value. Um, really, really struggled they, and um, how they didn't allow themselves to be one of those companies that just fades into oblivion. They turned it around to be a, a, a world beater, a second, kind of like an Apple story, right? Yep. Been at the top, went down to almost gone, then built it back up. And it's a very similar story where the, the founder and CEO comes back to make it happen. But he's very transparent in the challenges and the mistakes he makes, which is really cool. Yeah. Has there been a, like a, a just a straight up doc on Kobe? I mean, it might be too early. Like, I'm sure people are working on it, but has there been anything that, because like, to your point, like you've got to yeah. go to a thing you didn't expect and, oh, you get a lot of yeah. Kobe out of that. Has there do you there know probably is. I don't know of it, okay. though. Because yeah. every time there's so we much see, content like there's there. more stuff, of every time you see stuff of him, it's like, oh, he was a special breed. Yeah. He was a different breed. Not perfect person, obviously, but but like operating at a There is level. one, oh my God, there's one scene in it that's just unbelievable that shows his, like how competitive he was yeah. in a way that like, I, I don't want to share it because it's like so awesome. <laughs> okay. And that was called what again? The it... Redeem. Redeem. Redeem okay. team. All right. This has been a long episode, so let's wrap this up. Thank you, everybody out there for listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. If you want to get a question in the queue for a future episode, find me on Instagram, PS Cummings, drop me a DM. I'll add it to our list. Until next week, keep chasing excellence. 